All right, let's get started. Uh, hello and welcome to the R Medicine pre-conference workshop intro to R for clinical data. My name is Stefan Kadaki, and uh, I'm dialing in from uh, the beautiful sunny Philadelphia. Um, I'm the chair of the R Medicine 2022 organizing committee and I'm uh, running this workshop. Um, I'm an assistant professor of pathology and laboratory medicine here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And um, so just a little bit about me, I've been coding in R for uh, I think more than 12 years now and I'm, I'm an R Studio certified trainer. And I've taught R to physicians and other healthcare workers at uh, the Harvard uh, Massachusetts General Hospital at the University of Pennsylvania and at various conferences, both online and offline. And um, uh, so this is not uh, my first rodeo. And I'm joined today by two co-instructors that, um, that I'd like to introduce. So here's uh, Joe Rudolph. Joe Rudolph is an assistant professor of pathology at the University of Utah. And Patrick Mathias is an assistant professor and vice chair of clinical operations at the University of Washington in Seattle. And we're fortunate to have two TAs help with the course today. So, um, so thank you very much, Rich and Sarah, uh, for helping out. All right. So um, I wanted to spend just a few minutes to uh, orient us to the technology. I know we've been in COVID times uh, for it seems like forever, but I still wanted to go over this real quick um, to uh, to uh, uh, give you sort of a sense what uh, what what we have in store for you. So, the um, we'll have the main part of the workshop in webinar style with everyone in one big session as we'll have 68 participants today and uh and you will all be muted and your cameras will be off and we'll be recording this session for replay actually are we recording yeah it seems like we're recording that's great um we'll also have uh one or two breakout sessions and for the breakouts we encourage you to participate by uh, turning on your microphone. We also encourage you to turn on your camera if you're comfortable, but that's completely up to you. Uh, and just so you know, we will not record the breakout sessions. Um, uh, these will be, these will remain private. So, um, so uh, this is, if, if, if this is, is this your main Zoom window? Um, uh, uh, on the bottom, you should be able to see, um, you should be able to see a, a, a button that says participants and when it uh, when, when it says chat, uh, it may look a little bit different now because Zoom has evolved. Um, but, uh, but what I want you to do is to have both of these windows open. You wanna have the participants windows op window open and you wanna have the chat window open. Uh, so um, so, so it, that, that should look a little bit like this. And um, this is important because this is how we're gonna communicate with each other. During the during the session, um, uh, we will make uh, some use of uh, the nonverbal feedback functionality of Zoom. And uh, at various points, I'll ask you to click yes to let me know that I can keep going. And what I mean by that is to click on the um, on the uh, and I think I think in your window uh, it says reactions. It'll say reactions, and uh, there'll be uh, sort of a, a, a white check mark on a on a on a on a green background, and we'll we'll try that out in a minute to see if that works for everybody. Um, we will also use the chat um, as uh, in case nonverbal feedback doesn't work. Sometimes we can't get it to work, uh, but also uh, as a communication tool to uh, to help you if you get stuck with a technical issue. Okay, so please note that you know if I'm presenting, I. It's, it's hard to present and also read the chat at the same time. So don't send me uh, when I'm presenting any private messages, just send to everybody. And one of our co-instructors or TAs will, uh, will, uh, will help you. Also, I want to just, just you know, set some expectations for help. Well, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, 74 participants today, uh, maybe even more later. Uh, so please only ask for help if you really need if you're really stuck with a technical issue with Zoom or the training environment that we'll introduce, if you have sort of a general question about the material, um, uh, we encourage you to write it down and ask during the breaks or after the workshop, we'll be hanging out and we'll be able to answer questions at that point. All right, so uh, uh, this is an interactive workshop. And so uh, this is this is uh, our first interactive exercise, and this is also where I'm going to learn whether the nonverbal feedback re uh, reactions will work. So what I'd like you to do is to locate 
the reactions, um, um, uh, where it says reactions in the bottom of your Zoom window, and uh, give me a uh, and click the yes button, the the green check mark. Okay, I see I see him coming in. Wonderful, that's great, that's awesome. Okay, looks like most of you are finding it. Okay, this is perfect because this is what we're going to use throughout the workshop for me to know whether something makes sense, whether I can keep going, or uh, whether you're lost. So I see lots of yeses. A given, uh, and then yes, and then please write your location, the city and country in the chat window. All right. So we have uh, Arastu from Toronto. We have, okay, it's too fast to read. Sergio from Toronto also. Uh, I see a lot of Philadelphia here. Chris from Greensboro, welcome. Okay. We have uh, uh, Corrado from, uh, from Italy, from pa Padua. Artemi from Russia. All right, well, welcome everybody. Sergi from Barcelona. Okay, this is a truly international audience. This is wonderful. Parth from India, welcome to the workshop. Okay, um, so uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, this, this is just uh, one, one more slide to, to or, or a few more slides to orient you to the course. Um, this is a gentle introduction to data science. It's designed for healthcare professionals and clinical researchers, or you know, people who uh, uh, who, who uh, work with clinical data, but don't have a background in programming. So, uh, if you know C plus plus, this is not the workshop for you. I'm assuming uh, I'm, I don't assume that there's going to be a lot of C plus plus programs in here. So, um, so the way we're teaching this is um is 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 using this this framework here this this data analysis pipeline pipeline framework um and um and so so the the way that we think about doing data analysis is that you always start by importing uh data and cleaning it or tidying it up uh which 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 puts the data into a it is sort of a format that makes it easy to do data analysis and then you start this iterative uh process of of exploratory data analysis. So this is EDA here, exploratory data analysis. And usually that requires some data transformation. And the main ways that you gain knowledge from your data are visualization and modeling. And then finally, you need to communicate your results. And so we'll introduce the basics of how to do all of this stuff with our, with the exception of modeling, because that's a bit out of scope for this very basic intro course. Um, uh, so, so, so that's that's sort of the framework. Um, then, um, then how do we teach this stuff? So, we will introduce new concepts with lecture slides, and we try to make them sort of, you know, pretty simple. Um, so, here's 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 a lecture slide that we will uh, that that we will show later on. And then, after after spending a few minutes introducing new concepts, we'll practice these new skills with inter timed interactive coding exercises. So like, like this, your, this your turn here. Um, and you will work uh, in a training environment on the web that we specifically set up for this course today. And it's imp an important thing I wanna point out that these exercises are timed. And uh, so, so you don't have to feel like you need to finish each exercise, but it's important that you try. Um, uh, and when the time is up, I really, really want you to ask you to stop working and return to the main session and listen to what we're doing, because we will then go back and uh, one of the instructors, whoever, whoever's teaching, will actually live code the exercise for you. And I guarantee that you're going to learn the most if you try the exercise, you know, struggle through however far you get, and then stop at the, you know, five minute or whatever uh, time mark, and then watch the instructor live code through that uh, through that exercise themselves. All right, uh, one more serious thing uh, I need to point out since this is an interactive course, um, we wanna provide a welcoming and supportive environment for everybody regardless of background or identity. So um, if you have any any questions about this, please take a look at the at our code of conduct, which is which can be found on the main uh, of the on the main page of the website, and also uh, to respect the privacy of participants, we don't uh, we don't allow screenshots, recordings, or photographs. Uh, all of the materials of the um, workshop are available online, and uh, and uh, you will have access to recordings that will you know after doing some video processing, we'll post on the website for everybody to see. 
All right. So um, this is uh, our second interactive exercise. This is going to be a meet and greet. And um, so we'll send you into breakout rooms where you'll have 10 uh, minutes to meet uh, uh, somewhere around 10 of your uh, fellow participants. And uh, what I'd like you to do is, you know, um, if, you, if you're comfortable, unmute yourself, uh, 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 hop on the camera. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I'd like you to tell each other uh, what you're hoping to get from this course today and what, what you're hoping to, uh, to apply your newfound R skills uh, towards. And the other thing that we're going to do is that the, co the TAs will jump into these sessions and they'll uh, hand out individually to each one of you your uh, login credentials to the training environment, and, uh, which we're going to start using in the next uh, upcoming session. Can I get a quick double check on the mic and then just on the screen share that the slides are presenting and that uh, the cloud's presenting? Okay, great, thank you. Then we'll go ahead and get started. So um, so it was great to meet those of you who I uh, met in uh, the breakout session. Now I'm really glad to meet the rest of you. My name is Joe Rudolph. I'm an assistant professor of pathology at the University of Utah. And, um, and in this session, we're gonna cover an introduction to R, R Studio, and R Markdown slash Quarto. So I'm sure you're all excited to get started programming and we'll do that in just a few minutes. Before we do that, I wanna introduce you to three items. The first is R. R is a programming language for data analysis. There are a lot of really wonderful things about R. It's freely available. Um, it's great for wrangling data um, and it's very capable for producing impressive visualizations. There's also a great community of folks using it for data science, um, and we're excited to welcome you all to the R community via this course today. So welcome. Then there's um, R Studio, and uh, R Studio is the name of a free piece of software um, made by a company called R Studio, which will be having a, a new name coming this fall, as pause it, but for today, R Studio. And you can think of R Studio as a sophisticated text editor for writing R code. You can run R Studio on Mac or Windows or even on a server, as we'll do today. Finally, there's R Markdown or at least that's what we used to say when we taught this course. Um, the next generation of R Markdown, known as Quarto, was recently released. Quarto is a computational document format that has executable code. Quarto also includes capabilities for annotating your work, which is incredibly handy, and it supports multiple programming languages for mixing and matching code. And if you're interested in hearing more about Quarto, don't forget to check out, join JJ Allaire's Quarto keynote, which will be on Thursday, August 25th. Uh, R, R Studio, and Quarto um, synergize for a robust ecosystem for performing data analysis. Um, so, without further ado, let's dive in, um, getting started with R Studio. So, as I just mentioned, R Studio can be installed on a server or locally on your computer. Um, R Studio server is a version of the R Studio um, development environment that can be accessed from a web browser. This is what we'll be using for today's training environment. RStudio Desktop, in comparison, is a version of the RStudio uh, develop environment that's installed on your computer. This is what you should use after the course to continue learning R and working on R projects. Um, we have a course website, um, which has been distributed and we'll share, share with you all. And in this, we've included links to videos demonstrating how to complete a uh, local install of RStudio Desktop, we also provide access to the course content via GitHub repository. So though the training environment today is ephemeral, you'll have access to the course content long into the future. Um, and one last reminder, please don't upload any external data, especially protected health information to the cloud. See, my slides are stuck here. Give me one moment. Okay. Um, so now we're going to um, get started and get logged into our Studio Cloud using the login credential. So you each received uh, a username, which starts with RMED, followed by three digits, and a password consisting of six digits. Um, in the breakout sessions. 
So navigate your browser to rmed101.cloud and use the login information that we provided you, username and password um, to get logged into um, the RStudio Cloud environment. And then we're using those reaction uh, feedback. So click the yes, that green check mark once you see the RStudio panes. And so we'll, we'll start a minute timer. It may take a little bit longer to get everybody logged in. And um, if uh, um, TAs and other instructors could monitor chat and give me a, a signal of, of how we're doing getting folks logged in. Looking pretty good. We have 20 uh, checkboxes already. 20 checkboxes in 20 seconds. That's great. So again, if you don't have username and password, drop a, a message in the chat to everyone and we'll have someone message you individually back with a username and a password. So it looks like chat, we've got one, we've got one who's looking for a username and password. Okay, got another request in chat for username and password. I'm gonna hold for maybe just another one or two minutes here. The getting folks uh, over the hump and into the environment uh, is, is uh, um, we wanna make sure as we can get as many people into the environment as we can. So Elizabeth, Elizabeth is asking, are the usernames the same as the password? So the user, so you should have received, and I think I sent this to you earlier, uh, a username that starts with RMED and some and three numbers. And the password will be a six digit number. And if you didn't receive that, I'll, uh, let us know in the chat and we'll get you a, a new credential. So we have 41 checkboxes. Please don't forget to let us know uh, 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 by clicking on reactions and the uh, the yes um, checkmark uh, that you have been able to log into the environment. Stefan, I'm not seeing any new messages pop into the chat. So up through uh, 38 after the hour. Can I get a quick scan of the of the check boxes. We got 45. Um, I think people are looking for the yes button. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so 
yeah, if, if folks are looking for the yes button, but they're logged in, we, that we'll, we'll count that as a success. We can, we'll can continue to find the yes button under reactions as we go through the course today. Um, if there, so I'm not seeing, okay, seeing yeses and not no. So I'm gonna continue, is that great. okay? Okay, yep. all right, great. Okay, so um, here's what the RStudio window looks like. On the top left is the editor. This is where we enter our code. On the top right is the environment and the environment allows us to look at data that's been loaded into R. Interacting with data in the environment tab provides some of the functionality that you may be familiar with from working with uh, point and click tools like Excel. The console is on the bottom left. You can use the console to quickly run an individual R command, like install a package, though we won't be using the console in this course today. We'll be largely focused on the editor. The pane we have labeled as miscellaneous, misc has a few tabs. The most important one for today is the files tab, which shows the files that we'll be using for the course. One of the most powerful aspects of working in the R environment is the ability to conduct reproducible data analysis, um, those that can be shared, revised, repurposed, and reproduced by others. To highlight the importance of reproducibility, let's consider the following case. In the mid-2000s, two researchers at Duke University tried to use microarray gene expression data of tumor cells to predict sensitivity to chemotherapeutic agents. The approach generated a lot of excitement at the time, and the resulting work was published in, in many high-profile journals, including Nature Medicine, JAMA, and the New England Journal. Unfortunately, there were a number of serious errors in the data analysis. The media has focused on the fact that the researchers tried to cover up investigations into these errors and press on towards clinical trials, even though there were, at the time, some open questions about the validity of the methods. Even more unfortunately, Patients were enrolled in clinical trials and allocated based on uh, flawed models. And in all likelihood, patients were actually allocated to the incorrect treatment arms. In the end, 18 papers were retracted and the institution settled uh, more than 10 lawsuits for an undisclosed uh, amount of money. Keith Baggerly and Kevin Coombs, biostatisticians at MD Anderson, uncovered the mistakes that led to these retractions in painstaking work. Let's look at one of the errors they found. These are a few of the hundreds of microarray probe sets, each corresponding to a gene, that the Duke investigators reported to predict sensitivity to 5 fluorouracil. And here are the probe sets that the MD Anderson team got. You can see that these two probe sets are different. If I highlight the last number of each probe, you might notice a pattern. The number of the probe set that Duke reported is exactly one less than the number of the probe that the MD Anderson team found when they redid the analysis. This is what's called an off by one indexing error. And it's what happens when you use a tool, uh, a point and click tool like Excel and accidentally delete one cell. The result is that all values in the affected column are shifted by one. And this is a simple error to make, but as you might imagine, the error invalidates all downstream results. The off by one indexing error was just one of many simple errors the MD Anderson team discovered. Another type of error that was pervasive to the study was label reversal, so that cell lines were labeled sensitive to a drug when they were actually resistant and vice versa. The type of error, um, this type of error can lead to a scenario where a patient gets the chemotherapy that would be predicted to be least beneficial to them. Other problems they identified were confounding, inclusion of data from sources that were not reported in the paper, and wrong figures shown. These are all simple errors. You don't have to be incompetent or negligent to make them. And because they're so easy to make, and because without good documentation or a reproducible workflow, it's hard to catch them, they're also unfortunately very common. So a key issue in this case study is that the investigators used point and click tools like Excel. Um, this prevented peers and independent investigators from catching errors in the analysis until it was too late. And the Duke study is only one example where the critical barrier to reproducibility was the tendency of investigators to use graphical user interface point and clicks style tools. These interactive tools usually don't record user actions, and because of this, they are fundamentally not reproducible. 
so but reproducibility doesn't just help others. Consider the following three statements and ask yourself if they found, uh, sound familiar. Can we redo the analysis with this month's data? Why did the data in table one not seem to agree with figure two? Why did I decide to omit the six samples from my analysis? Your closest collaborator uh, is you from six months ago, and you can do yourself a huge favor by using tools that promote reproducibility. And if you're analyzing clinical data that might affect patient management or public health based on your findings, um, that makes it so much more important that you take the steps to ensure that your analysis is documented free of errors and reproducible by others. So we mentioned the um, idea of R Markdown and the newest version again of R Markdown is called Quarto. So that's what we're gonna refer to going forward is Quarto. Quarto provides us with the features and tools to tackle the reproducibility problem. In Quarto, we can craft computer code mixed in with narrative annotation that documents the purpose of the code and details about the decisions that we made in our analysis. Quarto provides a lab notebook style interface for analysis, visualization, and annotation of our work. Like our markdown before it, Quarto is quickly becoming the gold standard for reproducible data analysis. In this course, we'll teach you how to use Quarto and we encourage you to continue using it consistently in your future work. In fact, it's the strongest recommendation that we'll make to you today. So Quarto documents are composed of three basic building blocks. The first is a header, which includes pieces like the name of the document and the document's author and the desired output format when the document is assembled. The second block is the text. Quarto documents can be marked in ways that promote readability with various formatting styles. So here you can see large and small headers, um, uh, plain text, also bulleted lists that cannot be styled as bold. You can include um, hypertext links. There's a number of formatting options. And finally, there are code chunks. Code chunks include R code that can be executed to output results. Within the Quarto document, we can execute a single code chunk by clicking the run code chunk arrow, which looks a little bit like a, a green play button, which I've highlighted here. And also with the click of the button called rendering, we can turn a Quarto document from um, the text on the left here uh, to this uh, um, organized and um, uh, annotated and presentable document here on the right. So let's look at this Quarto document in greater detail. Again, the first block is the header section. And on the left, you can see the input. And on the right, you can see the output once the document is rendered. The second block includes narrative text with styling applied. Then we get to the code chunks shown in gray boxes. Don't worry about the grammar of these particular code chunks at this point. In brief, the first code chunk generally generates 100 normally distributed values, which, are, which we are performing a summary on. The rendered document shows us our code and the output of that code. The second code chunk here renders a histogram visualization of that data. The result is a neatly formatted document that includes an annotated description of our analysis, the code we used, and the output of that code. So it's your turn again, your turn number two. Follow the instructions in your, number, your turn number two to open a Quarto document, review the format, execute individual code chunks, and then render the document. We'll meet back in three minutes to review this exercise together. Hey, th thanks so much for the uh, for Sarah saying that I that my mic is muted. I was uh, <laughs> put myself on mute for sixty seconds, didn't pop back. So, so once the um, time is elapsed on the timer, we want to get back together and do the exercise together. So, as Stefan mentioned in the intro, the most important thing um, that um, we ask you to do when we do the exercise is to give them a try. But if you're not finished with the exercise when the timer's elapsed, don't worry, we're going to run through them all together. And so um, just stop working on the exercise individually, turn your attention back um, to the screen share, and we'll go through the steps together. So for this, um, for this year turn, in the RMED cloud, we're asked to open, um, I asked you to open a new Quarto document. So file, new file, Quarto document. 
And um, you have an option here to, to title your document at the time that you create it, or you can, and you can change the title later. So I'm just gonna leave mine as untitled and click the create button. Once I do that, you'll notice that a pane opens on the left to create um, what we referred to as the environment pane. And in the environment pane, you can see the, the standard building blocks of a Cordo document. So we have the header up here um, with some data about the title of the document and the format that we're gonna output it in. Then there's a text chunk here, uh, which uh, has headers and some text and also a hyperlink embedded. And then as we scroll down, can see that there are R code chunks embedded here. And again, those are code chunks are, are um, distinguished in the document by these gray boxes. And for the year turn, we ask that you review the various elements. So those three elements, the header, the text, and the code chunk, and then execute those code chunks by using the run current chunk arrow. Again, that's that, this green play button here. So if I select that, you'll notice that the code chunk runs and the output is displayed below it. So one plus one is two. And um, then there's a second code chunk in here, uh, which has some parameters set um, around um, echoing. And I think it's, it's not um, um, important that we uh, think about the concept of, of echoing at this point, but just practicing the, um, the muscle memory of pushing that run code chunk arrow. And then uh, after we've reviewed the contents of the document and we've rendered the, or we've um, executed the individual code chunks, we can click that render button here and that will run all of the code in the document and compile that neat, neatly formatted document for sharing. So if I click the render button, it's gonna ask me to save this. And so I'm gonna name this sample document and click save. And after I do that, the code will run and then it'll output this compiled and executed document here in a new tab. And so to get back to the um, RStudio cloud working environment, you'll you notice that the, the um, Quarto document was just rendered as another tab and saved. So we can close that by Xing out and that takes us right back uh, to the RStudio cloud environment. Okay, importing data. Now that we're familiar with how to create a Quarto document, we can begin the process of performing data analysis in R in earnest by importing a clinical data set. This diagram may look familiar to you. You saw it in the welcome presentation um, that Stefan shared and you'll see it in other presentations throughout the day today. The first step in the data analysis pipeline is to load the data um, into the environment so we can begin to tidy and transform that data. In today's course, we'll be using a de-identified data set consisting of COVID-19 laboratory test results from a microbiology lab. This data is stored as a CSV file. So what's a CSV file? CSV stands for comma separated values. A CSV file is a plain text file, which means you can open it in a text editor and look at it. Here we have a CSV file with the names, medical record numbers, dates of birth for three fictional patients. This data structure is called rectangular because it falls into rows and columns where each row has the same number of columns and each column has the same number of rows. Also note that this particular CSV file includes what's known as a, a header row instead of data in the first row. This includes a descriptor of what kinds of data is found in each column. CSV files often, but do not always have such a header row. To import our CSV data, we need some additional data analysis tools. And in this course, we'll be leveraging a set of tools called the Tidyverse. The Tidyverse is a modern set of tools for data analysis in R. And it is um, like Quarto is becoming a de facto standard for doing data science with R. The basic tenets of tidy data analysis include that data should be organized in a consistent standardized way each row is an observation and each column is a variable. This is a very common way to organize data in a spreadsheet and will sound familiar to you um, if you've used other um, point and click tools like Excel to organize your data. 
programming code that acts on the data should be consistent, concise, and mimic the narrative language as much as possible. And the third tenet is that each data analysis can be broken down into a series of atomic steps, such as select this column or arrange the data by values in that column. Accordingly, an arbitrarily complex data analysis can be broken down as a pipeline of atomic steps. The tidyverse is a package, um, a collection of functions, data, and help documentation that we can use to extend the functionality of R. Packages need to be installed explicitly with the command install.packages. So let's say you want to install a package named tidyverse. You go to the R console and type install.packages, open parentheses, tidyverse in quotations. Each package you want to use needs to be installed only once on each computer. However, in order to use the functions or data in the packages, you may also need to load the package. This is done with the command library. So to enable all the functions in the tidyverse package, you type library, open parentheses, tidyverse. Packages remain loaded until you quit R. So every time you start a new session, you have to load each package that you want to use again. On our RStudio server, you won't need to install any packages for this course. We've pre-installed them for you. But at times in this course, you'll need to load packages and we'll practice this activity later. So these are the first two commands that we've, been, we've covered, install.packages and library. Once the tidyverse package has been loaded via library, we can import CSV files using the read underscore CSV function. Here's a template for how to use the read underscore CSV function to create a data frame object from a CSV file. You start with the name of the data frame object. Then you have this leftward facing arrow, then the read CSV function and the file name in parentheses. This code struct is, construct is exceedingly common in R, so we want to spend a few minutes exploring it together. Again, read underscore CSV is a function. Remember that functions are defined in packages. We loaded the tidyverse package to be able to use the read CSV function. You may be familiar with functions from math class. A function takes an input, say an X value, and returns an output, say a Y value. Functions in computer programming also take inputs and then return outputs. But the inputs and outputs here are the arguments and objects that exist within the context of a program, programming language. For read CSV, the input is the file name of a CSV file, and the output is a data frame with the contents of that file. The input that goes into a function is called an argument. The argument to a function gets put in parentheses. A function can have zero, one, or even many arguments. If there's more than one argument, we use a comma to separate them. And we'll see examples of that later today. The read CSV function outputs a data frame. Uh, you can think of a data frame like a table. But if we want to capture that data frame, inside of a named object, we need to specify that explicitly. It's a great idea to capture the output of a function into an object so that it can be used as an input for other functions, for example, to summarize or visualize the data in a named object. To, to put the output of read CS, the read CSV function into a named object, we use what's known as the assignment operator. The assignment operator is a smaller than symbol followed by a dash or minus sign. And it looks kind of like an arrow pointing to the left. It's usually read, read as the concept gets. So let's put these pieces of um, together to load our COVID data set. This line of code reads, the COVID testing object gets the output of the read CSV function on the COVID testing CSV file. You might notice that one of the objects is put in quotes and the other one isn't. To be honest, quotes can be quite confusing in programming languages. Names of objects such as data frames don't get quotes. In contrast, literal file names are always put in quotes. This is a part of the grammar of coding, what we refer to as the syntax in R. 
that will become more familiar to you as you develop proficiency and comfort with the language. Okay, one final year turn in this uh, session. Um, in this exercise, we'll ask you to open an R Markdown document and follow the instructions contained in that document to load and explore our data set. Um, you can find this document under the miscellaneous pane and select the folder exercises. In that folder, you'll see a document um, that starts with 01, the introduction. Um, open that document and follow the instructions uh, within to complete the exercise. We'll meet back in five minutes and go over this exercise together. All right, so the five minute timer's up. Um, thanks everyone for, for engaging with this, um, your turn. So we're gonna gather back together and we'll go through this, your turn as a group and we can fill in any of the gaps. So for this year turn, I asked you to, um, in the MISC pane, find the folder exercises and open that folder. And then within that folder, you'll see a number of documents contained. And I asked you to open 01 introduction, which is a quarto document format. Once I click that, we'll see that the environment pane uh, launches again. And in that uh, we have, um, uh, the contents of the 01 dash introduction. You can see at the top, we have a, a header here, and then it's followed by some, some uh, text uh, that describes the analysis um, that we're gonna do and some of the functions we're gonna use, such as read CSV. And so as we read through that, um, the instruction is to run the following code chunks. So you can see that there's an embedded code chunk. Again, that's code chunks are off, set off from the rest of the page by this gray box, and we can run the code chunk by pushing the uh, run current code chunk. Um, you'll notice that, that uh, R provides us with some, some feedback here, uh, which is a, a warning, and we'll discuss the concept of warnings later, but for the purposes of this first exercise, we can ignore that, um, we can ignore the contents of that warning. And you can see that after I ran the current code chunk, I now have a data element that's been populated um, here. Uh, the next um, set uh, or part of the exercise asks us to inspect a data frame. And so you can see on the far right, we have um, our object that's been uh, created in the environment. And if I select that, I'll get a new tab that opens up that looks uh, very much like a spreadsheet. And it's got our data arranged with a header row here and some column names, and then individual observations listed below. And the first question that we had was how many rows are in the data frame and how many columns? You can see here next to the, ob or, um, next to the COVID testing object, that we have 15,524 observations. So those are rows and 17 variables, which are columns. You can also see that information um, displayed here below the, um, before, below the element. The second question um, or, uh, asks us to try and edit one of the values in this viewer. And you can see that if I try and select any one of these values to change it, I'm able to highlight it, but I'm not able to change it. And this is an intentional feature so that we're not able to edit um, da our data in ways that are not traceable and reproducible. So we need to edit, if we're gonna edit our data, we need to do it with code so that we have um, a lineage, lineage and, and tra traceable way to, um, to um, follow the changes that we've made to our data set. The third question asks us to look at the pan day column, which uh, represents um, starting with uh, day zero, the number of days into the pandemic. And, you, and so the least, the first result in this table um, it happened on day four. And we can actually click these arrows up at the top here to toggle and sort in other directions. So let's sort it in reverse. And you can see the last, data element in this row, um, or uh, last observation in this um, object occurred on pan day 107. We can also add uh, filters to this. So there is a filter button right here. 
And a uh, question for asks us to add some filters. So how many overall um, tests were positive? So if we inspect some of the, um, the variables or columns here, we can see that there's a result column shows negative. So if it's if there's a negative in there, I wonder if there's a positive. So I can type in POS. And when I do that, I see that 865 of the entries in this table of uh, 15,000 observations uh, were positive. If I wanted to add another filter, we can layer filters on top of each other. Um, and so how many tests were positive in the first 30 days of the pandemic? So I can then adjust the pan day from zero to 30. And when I do that, I get a smaller subset of the data that is both positive and has a pan day between zero and 30. And you can see here, I have 137 observations within this total number of observations of over 15,000. Okay, so to recap what we've covered um, in this introductory lesson, we started by defining and differentiating R, the programming language, from R Studio, the development environment, from Quarto, which is the document format that we use for reproducible data analysis. In addition to learning to create and edit Quarto documents, we discussed some basic coding vocabulary, including Packages, such as the tidyverse, which extend the functionality of R. We use the install.packages function to install packages and the library function to load them into the environment. Functions do stuff on our behalf. They accept arguments and we can store their output in named objects using the assignment operator. And finally, we discussed and practiced importing data using the read score CSV function from the tidyverse and explored this data visually. So at the end of each lesson, we've included a what else section to introduce you to what else you might want to explore and learn about after completing this course. This includes helpful hints, other functions in the tidyverse and exciting packages you may want to check out. So the data import cheat sheet helps with the grammar of importing data, including other file types and those with other separators like pipes instead of commas. The data import cheat sheet is available on the RStudio website. There are a variety of other packages out there designed to deal with different file formats, Excel, um, SPSS, Google Sheets. Um, there are ones um, to scrape the web uh, and even handle JSON data. You can also connect to a variety of different databases directly in R to source your data. And if you use any databases in your institution, uh, you may want to explore these um, and check out these tools to make database connections in R. Um, in this uh, lesson, we practice rendering our analysis to an HTML file. In addition to HTML files, Quarto increasingly um, supports rendering in a variety of other additional formats. Um, and even um, rendering for interactive dashboards is on the horizon. So we're going to look at uh, dashboards in greater detail later in the course. And then um, finally, the Reticulate um, package provides an interface between R and Python. So this means you can mix and match code chunks written in R with code chunks written in Python. Um, R does many things very well, but no programming language is perfect for all tasks. And so it's great that R gives us tools to mix and match languages and different code chunks in situ. For those of you who are new to coding, we do recommend that you focus on a single language to develop proficiency before moving on to another language. This shortens your learning curve. Um, for your first and future languages. And so with that, I will um, end the first session. All right, uh, welcome back everybody. Um, and welcome to the second session on data visualization. Just one second. All right, um, so to get started, let's take another look at um, the COVID um, testing data frame that Joe introduced earlier. And uh, you might remember that it had a lot of rows and columns. And um, so each row here represents a single COVID-19 lab test that was run at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, uh, actually, not really. So this is actually a completely synthetic data set uh, in which none of the entries are actual patient data, but it's modeled 
to represent the underlying pattern of this data that we've seen here at CHOP uh, since in, in, in the first uh, few months of the pandemic. So the pan underscore day uh, variable represents the day of testing, starting with zero at the beginning of the pandemic, which was sometime in late February of 2020, which seems like a very long time ago. Uh, so by just glancing at the first couple of rows, you can see a few things right away. Um, so there was only one test done on the fourth day, then two on the seventh, and then three on the eighth, and then a whole bunch on the ninth. Um, and it seems like there's a gradual ramp up in testing. Also, if you look at the result column, it looks like at least in this first few days, uh, all tests uh, were negative. So um, now um, I'm going to ask you, uh, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you uh, what what you think the following plot that I'm going to describe to you would look like. Um, uh, so consider this COVID testing data frame we just looked at. And what do you think a plot would look like where on the x-axis uh, you have PAM day, the pandemic day, and on the y-axis uh, you have the number of tests that were performed on that day. And so what I want you to do is just to take a few seconds and try to like mentally visualize this graph or doodle it on a piece of paper in front of you. And once you have an idea, uh, uh, click yes to let me know to go on. All right, I see the yes is coming in. All right, so we have a lot of yeses. So you have sort of a mental image. Um, so, uh, so what I asked you to imagine is a plot in which we have the count or the frequency of tests on the y-axis, and that's broken down the uh, uh, pandemic day all over the x-axis. And um, and this is exactly uh, 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 Xalata. Uh, I don't know if that's if I pronounced your name correctly. That is a histogram, and uh, that is this type of plot. So. Um, so let's build a histogram of COVID tests by pan day. So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to ask you to do now is um, to go into your R Studio console, um, not the editor that we have used so far, but the console, and uh, type in this code here, uh, starting with uh, ggplot exactly as it's written here, and uh, want we'll to make sure that you really. Uh, type it exactly as it's written because otherwise it's not going to work. Um, and when you are done and you actually see a graph, give me um, a click on yes in the reactions and let me know that you've that you've completed this task. Okay, I see one yes, two, three. All right, looking good. If you're getting an error, um, just double check the spelling. Parentheses are can be can be very tricky, and they need it needs to be precise. Uh, uh, yeah, co code is computer code tends to be uh, unforgiving uh, with uh, with misspelled words or uh, or um, punctuation. All right, um, is this what you get? Great. Uh, actually, uh, when you run this code, um, uh, you'll get what looks like an error, but it's actually just a message. Uh, R lets you know that uh, when you ask it to draw a histogram, uh, you should tell it how wide each bin should be or how many bins there should be, because this affects the granularity of the data displayed. But it'll 
actually just pick um, a default value for you. This is so. So I'm pointing this out for two reasons. The first is um, uh, this. This is this is actually a useful message, um, uh, but uh, but R tends to uh, kind of present these messages in fire uh, fire truck red. Um, and uh, beginning programmers often feel like, oh my gosh, I did something wrong. This is an error. Um, if something is an error in R, it will always say error. And if it doesn't say error, then it's a message or a warning. So this is really just a message. Um, and the second uh, the second thing, so, so if you see something that is fire truck red, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that, uh, that you did something wrong. Um, the second thing that I want to point out is that Oftentimes, R um, uh, you know, has uh, sort of tries to do tries to um, come up with a reasonable default that will work for you um, uh, and not complain that something is missing. So, uh, as, so, 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 even though we didn't tell the histogram, you know, we didn't tell R in this case that we wanted to have uh, this and this many bins. It still actually created a graph for you, but then it also complained about it. It's like, yeah, you should really tell me the number of bins or you should tell me the bin width. So this is a useful message and it's it kind of gives you sort of a, a sense for, for how R kind of vibes when you interact with it. Um, so when I asked you to imagine what this uh, plot uh, might look like, then the number of COVID tests that were performed on a given day over time you might have imagined something like this. Um, initially, you have very few tests that are being run, and then uh, maybe because the pandemic hasn't really started yet, and then also maybe because the test isn't broadly available. Um, at some point, the number of tests ramps up uh, significantly and um, uh, and then remains at sort of a high level. Um, but this simple visualization tells you so much more than that general shape or these general few ideas. You can see, for example, that by 30 days, uh, the testing ramp up settles, or it tells you a few things that may, you may not have expected and may want to look at later. Like, for example, there's something going on with test volumes going up and down, um, you know, after uh, after the 60th day here. And none of this, and none of this would have been apparent from looking at a data frame or a spreadsheet with 15,000 rows. So the point of this exercise, and it may seem trivial, but it's actually quite profound. Is that uh, is that um, is that visualization really is what what's is one of the main engines of knowledge generation? Visualization is one of the main tools uh, you have in your uh, tool belt as a data analyst to understand what's going on with your data. So, um, uh, and and if you don't visualize your data, um, you might have some ideas of it. Uh, you might have have some ideas about it, but usually they're incomplete and oftentimes you're wrong. Uh, so, so, so you really want to have, uh, you want to be able to visualize data quickly. And uh, this is where uh, ggplot comes in. So, so ggplot uh, is a package for making, uh, for creating graphics in, uh, in R. It's part of the tidyverse. Uh, so it will get loaded when you load the tidyverse package with library tidyverse. And ggplot provides a grammar of graphics uh, for data visualization. And the idea that something um, uh, that something uh, uh, has a grammar for something is actually actually pretty common in R, especially in the tidyverse. Uh, so this idea of grammar gets thrown around a lot, and we'll hear it later uh, today. Uh, but essentially, the idea is that there should be a consistent way of doing something. And for ggplot is that there should be a consistent way to build any type of uh, uh, graph. And um, and having a consistent way to make any type of graph makes it easier to learn and also easier for humans to read the code later and make sense of it. And that's super important because most people who use R are not programmers. They're, they're not uh, primarily, um, you know, they, they don't spend most of their time uh, in, a, in a code editor. And the idea of a grammar of graphics is um, basically boils down to this idea. You should be able to specify any type of graph by, by specifying the data that goes into it, the type of graph that you want to have, and a mapping that explains how the data from a data frame should be represented as visual marks on that graph. 
and having a consistent, and we'll go back to this uh, definition uh, uh, in just a second, but having a consistent grammar means that once you learn how to make a histogram, you can apply that knowledge to make a scatter plot or a box plot with little extra effort. You don't have to learn how to do any kind of, like all kinds of different plots using completely different syntax. So this makes it easy to generate lots of different graphs uh, quickly, and it helps you to understand your data more quickly. And finally, I want to point out that ggplot graphs look great in the, uh, in, in uh, I use them all the time for uh, for reports, and uh, you can you can make generation you can generate publication quality uh, plots with ggplot, uh, 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 no question. So um, uh, uh, so 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 here's a quick analysis of the code that we just typed into the console to make that histogram. So you can say that see that we give it a data frame. Uh, in this case, our COVID testing uh, data. And we specify the type of plot uh, or the geom, in this case, a histogram. Uh, and we specify an aesthetic mapping. Um, in this case, we're saying that we want the x-axis to represent uh, the pan day variable of the COVID testing data frame. Uh, since this is a histogram, I don't have to specify the y-axis because in the histogram, the y-axis is always the count of cases, which for COVID testing is the count of tests in a particular bin. Uh, and a few additional details about this, um, about this code are you always, in ggplot, you always start a plot with a ggplot function, in invocation of the ggplot function. To connect the ggplot function to the geom function, you use a plus sign, which usually you put at the end of a line uh, followed by a new line. And that all the mappings, uh, and we'll talk in more detail what mappings are, but all mappings go inside of the AES function. AES uh, is for aesthetic mappings. So that was a lot of information. Let's try to consolidate this into a more general template that you can use to make your graphs. So here is a template for making any kind of graph with ggplot2. So you start with the code that's written in black here. So black is you know, the, the constant part. Um, and you fill in the details that are written in blue. Um, the first detail is a tidy data frame. And this contains the data that you want to plot. So what do I mean by tidy data frame? So the idea of tidy comes up a lot in the, you know, in the definition of the tidyverse. But here's the definition of tidy. So a, a, a data set can take on a lot of different shapes, but there's one in, uh, one shape that is best suited for data analysis, and that shape is called tidy. And a data set is tidy if, number one, uh, each variable is in its own column, each observation is in its own row, and each value is in its own cell. And the opposite of tidy is often called messy, and oftentimes um, a lot of the data analysis work uh, is to convert messy data into tidy data. But for now, fortunately for us, uh, the COVID testing data set is tidy already because it, uh, it conforms to these, it complies with these requirements of each variable in its own column. Uh, for example, pan day is a column. Each observation is one row, one observation is one lab test, and each value is in, in its own cell. So we don't have any cells that have multiple values in them. Okay. So, um, so we pick a tidy data frame. That's the first step. The second step is to pick a geom function. And this is how you tell R what kind of a plot you want it to make. Um, we'll go into more detail about what geom functions are. But for now, just know that you need to tell ggplot what type of graph you want. And you do that by picking the right geom function. And here are a couple of useful geom functions for visualizing the kind of data that we see in um, you know, clinical practice, uh, but there are many more. And with these six, you can make histograms, you can make um, uh, bar plots, uh, scatter plots, dot plots, box plots, and line graphs, okay? So the third and last, so we picked a tidy data frame, we picked a geom function, uh, the last uh, step, the third and last step is to write uh, what's called aesthetic mappings. And this is where you tell R how you want the columns of the data frame represented as graphical markings on the plot. So what's an aesthetic and what's an aesthetic mapping? An aesthetic 
is uh, a thing that you can perceive about a specific data element on a graphic, um, such as this position on an XY grid, uh, but also other features like, for example, its color. Um, and aesthetic mapping is how you tell R how you want to represent the columns or select columns of a data frame on the plot. Okay, let's look at an example here. Consider this data frame with three columns, A, B, and C, and this X, Y grid here. So this is my graph. And um, so, uh, so this aesthetic here, uh, uh, this aesthetic mapping here defines that the X value or the graph uh, should come from the, um, of the graphical marking should come from the uh, A column, the y-axis position should come from the B column and that the color should come from the C column. And as a result, you get the following graph, uh, which visually encodes uh, all the information from these three columns in, in the data frame. And R automatically figures out uh, things like axis limits and the color scale, and you can manually fine tune this. Uh, so this is, again, another example of R coming up with sort of a reasonable default and and then you can uh, you can find fine tune the, the the heck out of it so um so so this is what aesthetic mappings are uh, essentially a list of these kinds of you know e e equations that uh, that connect uh, uh, features of the graph with uh, um, with columns from the data frame so aesthetics are powerful and fundamental concept in the grammar of graphics. So, so I want to do a quick uh, your turn um, to uh, just explore this idea and consolidate this idea a little further. So, um, so we looked at X, Y position and color. Are there any other aesthetics that you can think of? And I want you to type your answers in the chat. Yeah, shape shape is definitely an aesthetic. Um, not sure what you mean by sex. I think I think sex may be a column and a data frame that you're thinking of, but that's not an aesthetic. Group is an interesting idea. I'm gonna come back to that later. Um, width, um, yeah, width could be an aesthetic. Um, so border and fonts are not actually aesthetics, and I'll explain why. Uh, Phil, yes. Um, size, shape, fill. Yep. Um, okay. So, um, alpha, that's a good one. All right. So, so this, this is great. Thank you so much for, for these answers. And, and there's, uh, there's actually, uh, a, 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 a lot of, um, of different types of aesthetics and they also depend on the kind of plot you're making. For example, for a line graph, uh, you can define the line width and line type. Uh, and for a scatter plot, uh, you or any kinds of dot plots, you can define the shape um, of the dots. And um, and so so, uh, so so some things that uh, that that you guys have pointed out, uh, like a font, that's that's not a, a feature of specific data elements that come from your data com. That's a, that's a feature of the overall graph. So this is not this wouldn't be considered an aesthetic. So, so that's where this this is where this is a subtle definition. So an aesthetic is really something that um, that can be encoded with uh, with values from a column, categorical or or uh, or um, or continuous. Okay, so um, so um, picking the best aesthetics for your graph is as much an art as it is a science. And and um, I'm going to have a recommendation for a reference. Uh, uh, which is going to be a great introduction to the topic of uh, how to how to create great graphs. Um, um, that's Klaus Wilkie's Fundamentals of Data Visualization, uh, which I'll talk about uh, at the end of the session. All right, so so let's let's recap. Um, to make any kind of graph, you start with this template, and you uh, you fill in the blue stuff. Uh, so you choose a tidy data frame, and this contains the data that you want to plot. 
and you pick a geom function and this is the type of plot you want to create and then you write your aesthetic mappings and this is where you map data columns to position color and other features of the graph okay um uh, let's 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 go back into the uh training environment and uh open uh the uh uh, O2 visualize quarter document document B. And I want you guys to work through the exercises uh, of the section titled your turn five. And there's going to be a big block that says stop here. I want you to stop there and not keep going because that's going to be for later. And um, if you're, we're going to, we're going to, uh, I'm going to give you guys five minutes to, uh, to work on this and then we'll come back together um, and I'll live code things. Uh, if you're done early, uh give me uh give me some feedback about this and by by clicking yes when you're done all right well, i'm gonna start a timer now all right time's up uh let's uh let's all come together and look at the um uh and look at the exercise together so here i'm loading visualize.qmd um okay so it's our markdown document your turn five uh, and I'm being asked to run the following code chunk, which uh, is all stuff that you've seen before. We're gonna uh, we're gonna load uh, the tidyverse, and we're gonna load another package called Lubridate. And this is a package that uh, that helps with uh, uh, it helps with uh, formatting uh, uh, dates. Um, and then uh, here we have COVID testing gets read CSV uh, COVID testing dot CSV. Um, this is all review. And we have the COVID testing data frame in the environment. So this worked. Um, so uh, the first uh, thing we're being asked is to recreate the histogram of Pan Day. Uh, and so uh, uh, we're basically retracing the steps of filling out the uh, ggplot template with the three pieces that uh, uh, that that uh, that we need to put into it: the the data set, which is going to be COVID testing, the geom function, which is going to be geom histogram, and uh, an aesthetic. Um, in this case, we want to uh, make the x-axis uh, the, the Pande variable. So, um, so what I have here is um, is sort of a, a fill, fill in the blanks kind of exercise, uh, and uh, which uh, actually makes it really easy for me to fill things out. Um, so, uh, my data set is going to be COVID testing, and um, and here actually wanted to uh, wanted to point something out that just happened. So. Um, so the uh, the R Studio editor is actually uh, uh, really tr really tries to be helpful when you're coding. So so I just started typing COVID, and uh, uh, and and this little little box here shows up. Now uh, this is um, uh, this is the R Studio editor saying, "Hey, uh, I think I think I know what you're about to type because." There is an object in my environment that also starts with the, with those um, with those letters, and um, so what I can do now is I can hit the tab button, and uh, this will autocomplete my uh, uh, my variable. And autocomplete is very powerful, um, not only because it can speed you up, but also because it can reduce errors, um, and um, uh, and so, so I, I highly encourage you to use autocomplete uh, a lot when you, uh, uh, when you, when you, when you get when you get something offered uh, by the editor, like, uh, uh, like, like autocompleting the um, the name of data frame, uh, hit tab uh, to complete it. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so this is now we pick the data set. The ne next, we want to choose the geome function. So that's going to be geome histogram, uh, and that goes down here. So, um, okay, what just happened? Um, this is actually uh, another uh, uh, reason for why autocomplete is uh, so awesome. And uh, you may have wondered why um, uh, all of these geom functions all start with the same prefix. And the reason is autocomplete, uh, because what happens when you start typing the name of a function, um, you're gonna get uh, the R Studio editor will show you autocomplete uh, uh, options. Not you know in this in this case there are many options, and it's smart enough to know that right now we're not looking for a data frame; we're looking for the name of a function. And um, 
and um and so uh so i can start uh i can start writing things and then it'll actually file down to the final uh to to the only um uh function that it knows of that uh makes sense in this context so so i can get to the point um where i can where i can uh, where i only have to write geom his and can hit tab but the other thing that's so cool about this is that in addition to the autocomplete box you'll also actually have a small help window and the help window tells you uh, not just kind of what the options the arguments are for your function that that you're that you're typing here but also the beginning of the documentation so from this i can i can find out that histogram is to make histograms and frequency polygons and it starts uh, uh, telling me how to how to use this function is suggested that I press F1 for additional help. So autocomplete is is completely powerful, not only to speed you up and to um, make fewer errors, but also to discover functionality without having to look into inside of a manual or looking things up on the web. Uh, so I really wanted you to remember uh, to autocomplete things. Um, okay, now we picked a data set, we picked a geom function. Finally, we want to uh, we want to write an aesthetic mapping. So the aesthetic mapping here is um, it goes inside of the AES function, and we want to uh, set we want to map x to pan underscore day. Okay, so let's see let's see what happens. Oh, okay, so we get we get a histogram and maybe a little bit less. Um, maybe a little bit less uh, obnoxious than when we wrote this in the console uh, uh, because it's not on fire truck red we get the same uh, uh, message from from R that we're supposed to use uh, we we're supposed to pick our own value for how many how many bins uh, to use or what the bin width should be of this histogram so um so that's actually that's that's actually a good idea and we want we want uh, we want to do that later so um, um, so in this next exercise, we want to fill uh, in the code to um, um, uh, uh, for 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 this modify modification of the previous function where we actually specified bandwidth. Okay, so uh, so here we just want to uh, type in testing, and we have geom histogram. Uh, x equals pen underscore day and um all right so um so uh what is the bin width that i'm supposed to use if i want to get daily test volumes anybody type in a chat okay yes so i see a lot of ones and that's correct uh because because uh, the variable uh, that we're binning is pandemic day, and so uh, so if we if we look at one day at a time, we get daily test volumes. Um, so uh, so let's see the what the effect is of doing this. So the effect of reducing the bin width is uh, is actually that the data is in much more granular detail, um, and um, there's actually also this this interesting pattern here all of a sudden. Um, so let's see what anybody want uh, to venture a guess and type in the type in the chat what they think these um, these troughs uh, may indicate. Yes, exactly. Those are weekends. And uh, so if you wanted to confirm that these are these are weekends, you could uh, like one simple way would be to count the number of you know see whether whether these these happen in uh, in um, in steps of sevens, yeah, which which they do. So um so uh so so that's that that's it that's exactly right. So this is this is very typical for uh for laboratory um uh data. You know, we just have less volume on the weekends. Um and uh so we kind of totally expect this uh this this pattern. Okay, let's next add some color. And um, so here we're now asked to copy and paste the previous code chunk. Um, and, and this is, I didn't write this exercise this way because I'm lazy and didn't want to write another 
skeleton of a code chunk. But because copying and pasting code is uh, something that you want to do all the time when you're working in R, when you're when you're working with code, so um, so copying and pasting, even though um, is 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 very simple, is exactly the same way that you're doing it in Microsoft Word. So I'm I'm highlighting um, uh, I'm highlighting everything that's in the gray background, um, and uh, you can go to edit uh, copy, or you can uh, hit um, uh, Command C or Control C if you're on a on a, on a Windows computer, and uh, and then uh, you can uh, uh, go to Edit Paste. Uh, all right, okay. I was able to do it with a keyboard shortcut, and here I have a new code chunk now. All right, now um. Now that I copied and pasted this previous code chunk, I can make a modified version of it. And I'm supposed to add an aesthetic mapping that maps the fill aesthetic to the result column. So, um, so remember uh, for this, uh, that uh, when you have a function uh, and you have more than one um, argument, then um, this list of arguments uh, needs to be a comma separated list. So, uh, so I need to write comma and then fill equals result. Okay. So two arguments passed to the AES function here. And this is what we get. So we have uh, R automatically pick a color scheme as uh, maybe not the greatest color scheme, but it automatically picked one um, where our, uh, our positive tests are in blue, our negative tests are in green, and the test results were invalid in red. Um, all right. <clears throat> Let's spend the next few minutes on an important conceptual distinction about how you can define aesthetics in your plot. And actually, this has come up in the chat already. Uh, so, uh, so this is a great segue into this next section. So consider this plot. Uh, it's the same as the one you've created at the very beginning of the session, right? Except the bars are blue, not black. So the difference is the fill aesthetic because we've played around with the fill aesthetic just now. Uh, we've used it to uh, to map it to the um, to the um, that's okay, uh, <laughs> Corrado. <laughs> um, so we mapped uh, the fill aesthetic to um, to the result uh, column. Uh, but this isn't really a mapping, right? Because, because, uh, because all bars are the same fill color. So they don't represent the values of a variable in the data frame. Instead, we're setting it to a constant value, the color blue. Let's see how we why, how we can do this with ggplot. So in the in the in in the um in the uh, in the exercise, we just map the like I said, we just map the, the fill aesthetic to the result column. Uh, uh, by rating fill equals results inside of the AES function, uh, which I'm highlighting here in red. So uh, the general rule is that if you define an aesthetic inside of the AES function, then that aesthetic gets mapped to a variable or to a column. So inside of AES, map it to a variable. If the aesthetic is defined outside of the AES function, as in this case here, so we have an AES function, uh, we only pass x equals pandy to it, but then uh, we add a comma and, and define the fill aesthetic inside of the GM history function, but outside of the AES function, um, then it gets set to a constant value like blue. And R knows a lot of different colors by the English name. Um, and just, uh, one, uh, uh, when caveat color names are one of those things that need to be put into quotes. Um, so to recap, um, setting versus mapping aesthetics. Um, uh, on the left here, we're setting aesthetics by defining it inside of the AES function. So you see the close parentheses is after the fill. It's just like we're defining it inside of the AES function. And that leads to uh, a mapping uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the aesthetic to a, col to a column in the data frame. If we define it outside of the AES function, but still inside of the geom function, then um, uh, the aesthetic gets set to a constant value. All right. 
that was setting versus mapping. Um, very important. Uh, let's talk about geom functions next. So we briefly looked at geom functions earlier, and you might now appreciate how that makes it so easy to switch one type of graph for another. Uh, but let's dive a bit deeper into the concept of geom functions. So let's consider these two plots. How are they similar? Type the answer in the chat. How, how are these two plots similar? All right, same data, exactly, yeah. Both display distributions, yes. Same X and Y, same axes, exactly. So if the axes are the same, uh, the data are the same, what's different? Um, uh, what is different that on the left, the data is shown as a histogram, and on the right, it's shown as what's called a frequency polygon. So a geom function is, is a function that given the data and the aesthetic mappings, which are, you know, which define what the axes are, generates a geometric object to represent that data. Um, so let's go back to, um, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, quarter document and work through the exercises of the section titled Your Turn 6 all the way through the end of the quarter document. Again, let me know uh, if you're done early. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll give ourselves five minutes to work on this uh, independently and then come back together in live code. All right, let's come back together and uh, look at the rest of the exercises in the um, quarter document. Um, all right, so um, uh, run the following code chunk, easy enough. Uh, Okay, so this looks uh, like something we've seen before. Okay, now um, now try to figure out how you would modify the code so it draws a frequency polygon instead of a histogram. Um, and I'm uh, not gonna uh, uh, I'm not gonna retype all of that code. I'm gonna because because my 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 gut tells me that it's gonna be very similar to this code that I already have. Uh, and actually, specifically, I think I'm just going to have to use a different um, geom function. Uh, but I actually don't know which what the, what the name of the geom function is to make a frequency polygon. So what I could do is I could, you know, Google it. Uh, but what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to see if I can use autocomplete to uh, uh, to to guess the correct function. So I think um, maybe the frequency polygon function. It's going to start with an F and it's, it's like frequency polygon or F poly or something like that. So I'm just going to type F. Uh, and here I already see something that might fit the bill, geom underscore freak poly. And, um, and that is indeed the correct function. So this is just to demonstrate one more time how powerful autocomplete is for discovering functionality that, um, that, that, that you want to use and how RStudio really helps you uh, be efficient this way. Um, okay, so let's see uh, whether I actually did this correctly. Yes, I did. Uh, so here we have our frequency polygon. Um, modify the previous code chunk so the uh, line color is blue. Um, okay, so is uh, if I want the line color uh, to be blue, is that a setting or a mapping? Type it in the chat for me, please. setting or mapping this is a setting and why is it a setting exactly it's not dynamic it's the same for all the data it's not the different color for each different uh different uh different outcome yeah so that's exactly right and i'm setting it to one thing i'm setting it blue i'm not setting it to some kind of a variable perfect okay great and then if it is uh, supposed to be a setting. Does it go inside or outside the AES function? Outside the AES function. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Arastu. Perfect. So uh, that will be color equals blue. Let's see if that works. And it did. Okay, awesome. But inside GM function. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, um, and uh, what do I think the following code will do? Uh, try to predict what you'll see. And uh, okay, so what 
this this looks kind of weird um this looks kind of like a frank and geom uh uh, a frank and gg plot function right because we're it looks like we're grafting a second geom function on top of the first geom function um and uh actually that's exactly what's happening here because we're having okay so first we uh we have a geom histogram and then there's a plus afterwards and a geom freak poly afterwards and what we see is that in one plot we get an overlay of um of these two functions. And um, this is actually a super uh, powerful concept for ggplot that you can compose arbitrarily complex plots by putting pieces or layers of them together um, uh, by connecting different kinds of uh, geom functions or other types of functions. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit at the end of the session uh, to create a, uh, uh, a very uh to as we, as we said earlier to fine-tune the heck out of a graph um all right so um but let's first recap what we've done already uh, uh at this point and and I know we we've gone through a lot um but uh the, but the the slides are going to be available for you and I'm going to have uh, further resources uh, uh, that I'm going to suggest at the end of this. So if you feel a little bit overwhelmed right now, that's totally fine. Uh, and I promise it gets better with practice. But let's recap what we talked about in this session. Uh, we talked about ggplot2. Uh, this is a package, an R package that provides a grammar of graphics. And uh, the idea of uh, ggplot2 is that you should be able to create any type of plot uh, using a simple template uh, to which you provide a tidy data frame and a tidy data frame is one in which each variable is in its own column each observation is its own row and each value is its own cell a geom function which tells r what kind of plot to make and number three aesthetic mappings and these tell r how to represent data uh, as graphical markings on the plot and uh, we talked about how aesthetics can be mapped to a variable or set to a constant value all right in this last part of the session, I want to show a few additional things you can do with ggplot without going into too much detail. Um, to save a plot that you've created on the console, uh, you can go to the plots pane uh, in the you know in the misc uh, uh, there's a plots tab in the misc pane in a miscellaneous pane, uh, right in the bottom in the uh, on the bottom right of the R Studio window, and then you can click on the export button and uh, save as image. And um, this this way, uh, this way you can um, you, you can create graphs that you that you typed in a console. So I hope that mo that you'll make most of your graphs inside of an R markdown or into a, inside of a quarter quarter document. And if you do that, you can still uh, save that image as um, on your computer by by right clicking on it and um, clicking on save image as. So this is how you can manually save plots that you made, for example, to put them into your PowerPoint presentations. Um, um, so we've only barely scratched the surface of what you can do with ggplots. Uh, for example, you can change how overlapping objects are arranged. For example, we, we, uh, we've we been working with a stacked histogram, but you can make side-by-side uh, -side bars also. Um, uh, you can use different themes, and these affect how non-data elements such as axes uh, and grid lines and background appear. So here we have a different theme. All the, the, the data look exactly the same, uh, but uh, here the, 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 the background is different. You can customize your color scales. Um, and um, and to, to be perfectly honest with you, this, this is a little bit more complicated than it, than it needs to be, but if uh, uh but but the uh there are lots and lots and lots of examples for how to do this by simply googling uh color customized color scale ggplot and you'll get uh you'll get a lot of code examples that you can use it is a little bit uh uh, uh less user friendly than it, it should be uh, um you can facet your plot that means breaking into subplots uh by another variable for example uh, gender or location in the hospital, and this is a very powerful way to uh, uh, to to visualize sort of high dimensional uh, high dimensional data. 
you can easily make radial plots or geographical maps and you can add uh, titles and subtitles annotations you can change the axis labels or their appearance or their fonts uh, all of that is possible and all of these elements all of these mani manipulations um uh like position adjustments or themes or color scales, facets, coordinate systems, um, uh, the, and, and text added to your ggplot. Um, uh, this can be uh, can be added by in the same exact way that we added a, a second layer to this Franken plot uh, in the very last exercise um, by by writing a plus sign at the end of your ggplot uh, uh, after your geom function or after your last gplot command. And um, and then and then following with a theme function or a scale function or a facet function or a coordinate function, and uh, and all of these functions are part of the ggplot package. So the ggplot2 cheat sheet, uh, which I've linked to in the resources, is is nice to have on hand uh, when you're exploring your data, and it, here it reviews the basic template that um, for building any type of plot. So here we have uh, uh, data, geom function, and mappings. So I, I didn't make this up. <laughs> this is uh, this is canonical, uh, uh, you know, teaching about ggplot that we're promulgating, promulgating here. Um, and it also lists uh, it lists useful uh, geom functions here uh, for for you know for one variable, two variables, and so on and so forth. So this is this is good to have on hand. Um, uh, if you like to learn more about what kinds of graphics are the most effective in specific situations, I, I recommend looking at uh, uh, at Fundamentals of Data Visualization by Klaus Wilkie. Um, this is a very recent, re, uh, readable and recent primer on data visualization and figure design, and it's available for free uh, at this address shown on the slide. And there's no need for you to write it down uh, because uh, I've also listed this in the resources on the course website. Uh, the serve minor package um, extends ggplot to make it straightforward to create survival curves and risk tables. Um, and the GT package uh, provides a grammar to, to, to create uh, not graphs, but display tables. And these are tables that you might want to show in a publication or in a you know on a regulatory submission, and the GT summary package, um, uh, uh, which uh, uh, makes it trivial to generate publication ready tables from tidy data, uh, complete with uh, uh, and and makes things like computing summary statistics uh, super trivial. In fact, uh, Dan Spielberg, the creator of GT Summary, taught a GT Summary workshop at R Medicine this morning. And if you missed it, uh, you'll be able to watch a recording of it uh, on the uh, R that will be posted on the R Medicine website in uh, in about two weeks. So uh, so definitely check out uh, GT Summary uh, if you're interested in making a table that looks like this. All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, everyone can see the PowerPoint screen. Yes. Okay. Awesome. All right. So, um, so we're a little bit behind schedule, but um, I'll do what we can to catch catch us up. So, uh, for this next section, uh, I'm going to cover um, really the kind of act of tidying and transforming data, uh, and really you know thinking about when we have a data set, we don't always receive it tidy. That this data set that we have. Um, happens to be tidy, so there there won't be as much uh, transformation or pivoting of that data to make it tidy. Um, but there there are some additional work that we we tend to do uh, frequently to get our data set ready to visualize and model. Uh, and so we're going to focus on um, some functions in the dplyr package, uh, which is really a, a package that's intended to um, to cover data transformation activities and a lot of bread and butter um, ways to transform data frames. So these, the nice thing about this package is that they, uh, the functions in, in dplyr uh, are, they, they use a consistent syntax or grammar for transforming data frames. And a lot of the these functions are actually um, borrowed from concepts in structured query language, 
or SQL, which is a common um, accessible language for querying databases. Uh, and so you, 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 if you, if you're familiar with SQL, you might actually recognize some of the names of these functions um, th that uh, offer equivalent functionality. And so the, the first function that we're going to talk about is uh, select. And this graphically just you know, shows a, a nice uh, quick illustration of how select works. This is essentially a, a mechanism to extract specific columns from a data frame. So when you use select on a data frame, you expect that you're going to have the same number of rows in your output data frame, um, but a decreased number of columns. Uh, and the syntax is, is very straightforward. You call the select function. Your first argument is your data frame that you're going to transform. Uh, and then your subsequent arguments are any of the, the names of the columns that you wish to extract from that. So in this case, we are taking our COVID testing data frame. We're applying the select function to that. And we are uh, specifically pulling out our MRN and our last name variables or columns from that data frame. So if we take a look at an example of our COVID testing data, data frame, we apply select to it. We select MRN and last name. This is the resulting data frame from, from that. So quick, quick quiz here, you can answer in the, the chat, which of these would successfully se select the first name column from our COVID testing data frame? Okay, great. I see lots of rapid fire Bs. That, that's correct. And so we have select our COVID testing data frame and then uh, first name, notice that the the um, spelling is exactly the same, same case as, uh, as what we see in our data frame here. For uh, bonus, anyone wanna guess what C here does in the chat? If you put a minus in front of that first name, what do you think might happen? So that would eliminate Great, right. So I see Salada, many other um, folks are chiming in. This would remove that first name variable. And so that's a nice shorthand way. If you want to just drop a single column, you can use that, that, that uh, syntax there. So that select is a really quick one to cover, really easy one. Uh, and that's just, a, that's a nice con convenient function uh, where, you know, if you have, especially if you have a very wide data frame, maybe you have, maybe you've pulled something from your electronic health record and it is 75 columns long and you don't care about all of those columns, you want a more compact representation, select is, a, is you know, one function that you can use to, um, to really trim that and, uh, and work with a more manageable uh, data set. And um, just quickly, I'm seeing, uh, and you can, if you take that select, function and you use the assignment operator, that backwards arrow, and put that into a new data frame, then that can store your output into a new data frame that you can work with, um, you know, from that point on. So that's a very kind of, that's a nice convenient way to, to kind of decrease the size of your, of your data frame. So filter is the next function that we'll cover that is, um, that is a, a little bit more interesting. And so the idea behind filter is that you can extract specific rows from your data frame that, um, that meet some criteria, meet some logical criteria. And so the output when you use um, filter is that you expect to have a data frame if you were to you know, take the output from filter and put it into a new data frame, uh, to a new object, you'd have a output that has the same number of columns um, but a, a smaller number of rows. And the way that this syntax works is that you, like other functions in dplyr, your first argument to filter is that data frame that you wanna transform, and you follow that with some logical test. And the, the kind of the way the 
way this operates is that R is going to evaluate for every single row whether that logical test you put in the filter argument is true. And if that is true, it will return that row. It'll bring that row over into your, your output. So you can kind of, you can see here, you know, conceptually you have this data frame, only some of the rows meet the criteria that you, that you have put in there. Uh, and only those will be taken, will be output from the function and could be put into a new data frame. So an example of a type of logical test you might apply, uh, you might want, you might have a column name and you might have some specific criteria and you're looking for equality. So you would use two equal signs here as a logical test to say that, you know, um, the column is equal to this criteria. And so to make that a little bit less abstract, we have our filter function here. We have our COVID testing data set as our first argument. And our second argument is a logical condition. So MRN equals equals. So this is a logical test here. This set of numbers. Uh, and so what R is going to do when, when you execute this is it's going to go through and, and evaluate every single row, determining whether this condition is true or false. And then if it's true, it will carry that over into the output. You can do the same, the same strategy will work um, for characters if you want to look for equality for a, a specific string. And so in this case, we have our COVID testing data set. Our, log, our logical condition here is last name equals to Stark. And note that this is in quotes. Um, Stark is not something that R will recognize. It is, a, it is a string. And so you're putting that in quotes and, and evaluating whether last name is equal to this value. And this would be the output for this specific data frame. This is the output that you would expect from evaluating filter here. And so equality is one logical test. There are actually multiple other logical tests that you can use. If you're evaluating um, a set of uh, conditions for a set of numeric values, so this might be very common. If you are looking at lab data, for example, you might want to see whether values are uh, outside of the reference range. For example, you may use less than and, and greater than to be looking for values that fall outside of some range. Um, we covered equals, you know, less than or uh, equal to, greater than or equal to, and then not equal to is also another type of condition you can use. And there's actually some additional um, conditions that, that, that could be useful uh, for this uh, as well. But you know, if it's a logical test in R, it's a candidate to be put into a filter function uh, and as long as you expect that there's an output that, is, that, that kind of results in a true or a false uh, for that logical test. All right, so another kind of quick quiz here for this, uh, this function, which of these would successfully filter the COVID testing data frame to test with positive results? Yeah, great, so I'm seeing lots of, lots of Cs here, right? So we have filter, COVID testing, result. This is a set of strings, you know, we're matching against the string here. So we put quotes around the positive here to look for equality um, to this. So great, great work, everyone. All right, any questions about select and filter? Those are kind of our, some of our rapid fire functions um, before we transition in, into talking about pipes. So if I can just uh, point out that uh, Dua made a great point uh, mentioning that um, uh, that uh, select and filter don't actually change your object. If you look at COVID testing before and after you ran a select or a filter command and it still has the same number of rows, still has the same number of uh, uh, same number of um, uh, 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 columns. Um, Correct. Yeah, that's a and that's a that's a great point. So one of the keys here is that when you are using the um, 
when you're using these functions, if you want to do something with the output, you know, those, these out functions are going to output something. They're not going to act on that, on that original data frame. You, you want to store that output into another object generally. And this, um, this is also a common pattern as we get into the next section when, when we use pipes and we arrange these functions, we put these functions into a, a order, into a sequential order. Uh, and very often we'll take the output of that set of multiple functions and put it into a, a distinct object. All right, and then what is this, the syntax to use select and filter in one chunk where Samuel will get to that actually right now um, in the next section. Um, and then how do you select, how can you select distinct values? Um, so I think th that is, if you're looking for a set of, uh, yeah, that exactly, Stefan. So Stefan's bringing up that there's a distinct function that you can use that, that can pull out um, distinct functions that are distinct uh, values. Uh, based off of some set of variables. All right, so let's move on to talk about pipes. And just quick, out of curiosity, quick show of hands or quick uh, yeses, show of yeses, who uses pipes routinely or who's familiar with pipes and, and uses them or knows how to use them? See a few uh, yeses here. Okay, so we have we have a, uh, quite a few, um, although not everyone is familiar with these. So this is good um, good topic for discussion here. Um, so for dplyr functions and for many other functions, uh, it's actually it's pretty common to want to be able to um, to put these put multiple functions together uh, and execute them sequentially in some order uh, and you know take the output of that and you know this is kind of a if you're familiar you think about um, things you're familiar with bioinformatics or you think about um, kind of genomic type of data uh, it's, it's you know commonly referred to in that uh, context as, as like a pipeline so there's a, a set of a sequence of activities that you're doing to a data set uh, that's going to result in some output and so R actually has a very similar construct uh, using a pipe operator. And so the, the general idea behind this, this operator is that it takes the, the, the result or takes the thing on the left side of the pipe and it puts that into the first argument of the function on the right side. And so in this example, you know, we are referring to uh, the filter function, we have our COVID testing data set, and we have some logical condition here. Uh, and as opposed to putting COVID testing into the filter function, we can actually put that in front of the filter function and pipe that into the filter function uh, as shown here. So this is the original um, way to call the function. This is another way to call this function. Uh, and you'll see the value for the, uh, of this shortly, but you know, this is, these two function calls are equivalent. COVID testing is being piped into the first argument uh, here. And so if we, for example, wanted to uh, actually look at multiple functions in sequence, uh, we might have our COVID testing data set. We are interested in filtering to just the, the results that were within the first 10 days of the pandemic. Uh, and then from that, we might just be interested in looking at the clinics, uh, just selecting out those clinic variables, that clinic name variable to see the clinics that were, uh, that were ordering tests in that first time period. And so this is, you know, this is the confusing thing about this uh, layout is that you're, you kind of have to work from inside the set of functions, the nested functions outwards. And it's not very easy to read. It's not as intuitive as to what the order of operations here is, unless you're very familiar with R. And so instead of nesting the functions in that way, an alternative is to use these pipes. So you can take your data frame pipe it into one function, in this case, the filter function, and then the output of this can be then piped into another function here. Uh, and so this is, you know, this allows you to kind of sequentially lay out multiple functions. Here, we're just focusing on these dplyr 
uh, functions, but you can you can imagine actually additional data manipulation steps that are chained together um, here uh, using these pipes. And this is you know, this is very easy to read because you can kind of sequentially follow what's happening with the data set across each line. Just one word of note, uh, with in very recent versions of R, I think R 4.1 and above, you may see uh, a newer pipe. This is actually a native pipe. Um, historically, R did not have did not have this concept of a pipe as part of the, the base R language. Uh, and so there was a, a, a package called Magritter that was incorporated into the tidyverse uh, that developed these pipes that you know you called uh, for the you called for these pipes. Um, but uh, since then, the, the R language has actually recognized the value of this concept and has um, has developed a base R pipe uh, that is looks a little bit different. It's two characters instead of the three here, um, and but it is equivalent. And there is actually a shortcut to type this. Um, whether or not you have a, a native pipe or a or the kind of the original pipe uh, de might depend on your R version. But if you do, I think it's command command shift M, if I remember correctly, um, is the shortcut you can use um, to put that in. So let's do a quick quiz here. Um, which of the following is equivalent to this? this line here. Great, so I'm seeing multiple Ds here. Great job, everyone. So this is data. We are piping that into select. That means that when we use the pipe, the what you see on the left hand is the first argument uh, to this function. Uh, and that would be equivalent to, to D down here. Okay. So that, that uh, pipe concept is useful because that also, now we can kind of not only think about trimming up our data set or you know, carving out specific rows or specific columns, uh, we can also think about adding columns or expanding our, our data set uh, as well. And we can do this again in sequence with other activities using that pipe function. So the, the function that we would call to create new calculated columns is called mutate. And so the output that we, we expect when we call mutate is that we have a data frame that has the same number of rows, but we increase the number of columns. And that column, the column uh, or the columns that we create are depend are the result of some calculation that we, we will provide. So the syntax here, I've transitioned here to the pipe um, syntax. So we're gonna take our COVID testing data set. We're gonna pipe that in. So it's the first argument or the data frame to, to this mutate function. And within the mutate function, our argument, our second argument or our argument after the data frame is we're going to call out a name for a new column. We're gonna assign that new column using a single equal sign. Remember, this is distinct from the double equal sign when we're testing for equality. This single equal sign is more like an assignment operator. Uh, and then we are going to call some calculation that's going to tell our what we put into this new column that's named, you know, what we put here on this side of the of the equal sign. So very straightforward example with our testing data set. We haven't really talked about some of the um, the turnaround times that you might uh, be seeing in the um, in the data set, but each row of, of our data set represents some uh, test order and, and some results. And each of those results has some turnaround times associated with them expressed in hours. Uh, and so we have a collection to receipt turnaround time and we have a receipt to verify turnaround time. And for those who are not as familiar with the lab terminology, collect to receipt just means, you know, from the time that the sample was collected to when it actually arrived in, in the laboratory and receipt to verify means the time that it was received in the laboratory 
to when someone uh, signed off on that result and you know kind of sent the result out the door um, for whoever is going to be using that result. Uh, and so in this case, we are using mutate. We, uh, and we're going to create a new column, CRTAT mins. Oh. And that is gonna get the output from this calculation collect is basically our collect to receive turnaround time or call rec tat time 60. So this is expressed in hours. We're just multiplying this by 60 to, to create a column that expresses that, that same concept in, in minutes. And again, with this mutate function, this calculation, you can think about it being applied very similarly to, uh, to our uh, mutate or our, our sorry, to our, um, so to our filter, function in that it's going to do this calculation. It's going to evaluate this for every row. The difference is as opposed to selecting or pulling out specific rows based off of the evaluation, here we're, we're using the calculation to create a, a value for every single row. So this is going to sequentially go through and perform this calculation for every row, put output into our new variable or a new column here. All right, so we've covered multiple dplyr functions. We're gonna actually um, kind of pull it all together and go through a set of uh, small set of exercises in our Quarto document for this lesson. So go ahead and go into your um, O3 transform Quarto document uh, and work through that first set of exercises and stop when you're, when you get to the end of that first set, set of exercises, um, go ahead and click yes. When you're finished, I'm going to start the timer here. All right, everyone time is up. So let's, uh, circle back and, uh, someone just give me a confirmation that I can see my R studio workbench screen. Yep. But maybe you can okay. blow it up a little bit. Okay. Uh, there we go. All right. So I'm going to open up my transform quarto here, jump down to your turn one, and I'm going to use these functions here. So I'm going to filter test to clinic to the pick you location. I'm going to select the, the column with the receipt to verify turnaround time, as well as the day from the start of the pandemic. Uh, and so again, we're using our pipes here. Our data set is COVID testing. So I'm gonna put that here into my, uh, the start of my pipeline. And for filter, I'm gonna use my logical condition, uh, my logical condition here. So what am I, uh, putting in here, any input from the, from the group as to what goes into this filter function. All right, thank you, Krishna Yang. So clinic name, you can see, you know, as I'm doing this, there might be some autocomplete two equal sign quotes, pick you. And then I'm going to select, you know, just these columns that I care about. So I'm going to reverse the order a little bit here. I'm going to put in pan day and see verify turnaround time. And I can tab to autocomplete if I see the right, um, you know, the right variable coming up. I can run this and take a look and you'll see that I have these, you know, I have, uh, I've selected these columns. This looks like it's correct. I'm not hundred percent sure because I don't have my clinic name here. So one other trick when you're troubleshooting these pipelines or you're going through and you want to evaluate the, the output at different stages is you can actually highlight just the part of the code that you want to run. You don't have to run the whole code chunk. And then you can hit command return on a Mac or control enter on a Windows machine and just run that and, you know, go through and see, okay, did, you know, did this part of the 
the the code work. So I'm going to look for that clinic name and I'm going to see, okay, this looks correct. I have, looks like every entry has pick you, which is what I was going after. So that looks right. Uh, and, you know, when I run this, I can also see there were 261 rows. If I run this, I just have these columns and then I have 261 rows here as well. So this looks like this, the output of this is correct. Uh, and I was able to kind of string these uh, functions together uh, to get my output that I, that I was interested in. So the second part of this exercise, we are going to use mutate and we're gonna create a new column called total tap, total turnaround time that, that really is the sum of that whole, you know, both of those intervals, collect, collection to receipt and receipt to verify. And I'm going to actually store this output in the COVID testing function and into a COVID testing object and view the data uh, in, the, in a new tab. So at the beginning of the pipeline here, I have my COVID testing object and I'm actually going to write the output from this code back into the COVID testing object. This isn't always necessarily recommended, but in this case, I'm not doing anything to, um, to really fundamentally change this data set. I'm adding another column to this. And so then for this mutate function, what am I gonna put here? I'm creating this new column called total TAT. What goes in here if I wanna calculate the total turnaround time? All right, great. Thanks, Victoria. So I see, and David. So I'm gonna sum up those. And then I'm, you know, also just put, put this in here. So as a quick little tip, sometimes you may not just wanna see the um, output in line below. You may wanna actually look at the whole data frame using the view function. So this view function is actually equivalent to if I was to click this table here to, to pop up the, the, um, the data set to view it. So I'm gonna run this whole chunk and verify that I have you know, my data set here and I'm gonna scroll all the way to the end. I'm gonna see that you know, Mutate has created this new total turnaround time. And if I you know, just do a spot check, I can see, okay, this looks like it's the sum of these um, here. And so this is, you know, this is kind of the, the intended outcome that I, that I wanted. And so I do see uh, Yang has called out that some didn't work. And so you know, in this case, we are using mutate to, uh, to evaluate or to create an output that is row by row. So every row is gonna have an output. Sum is typically something that we use when we want to within a column sum up all the values within that column. Uh, and that actually um, can be handy for um, uh, kind of using uh, the summarize function, which we're not gonna cover today, um, but is a, um, it was another, um, that's kind of one mechanism you can, you, you can use sum uh, in the context of. In this case, for mutate, because we're doing that calculation row by row, and we're taking you know two columns and adding those values together, we're just using a simple addition operator here. All right, so in the interest of time, we're going to kind of stop with uh, going over new functions in dplyr at, at this point, but just be aware that within the slides, you, you, have, con you have access to the content um, afterwards. In addition to these exercises, we also have solutions on, on the site. Uh, and so uh, one thing I would strongly recommend if you are not familiar with the functions group by and summarize. This is a very powerful tool, uh, set of tools um, that you can use to create summaries of subgroups of your data. And so I would highly recommend, we're not gonna cover it um, because of time limitations. Uh, here, we're gonna jump to the dashboards um, lecture um, here, but, uh, but just be aware that there are slides here that you can, uh, that you can review around group by and summarize. There's a great, material in the R for data science book 
uh, and there are exercises, there's a another exercise we can practice and you can see the solutions for. Um, and so I'm going to actually just, one thing I will mention, I'll skip to, um, I'll skip to the end of the transform section and just mention a couple other things real quick. You know, we covered select, uh, filter, and mutate. You know, select for extracting columns, filter to to uh, to filter out specific rows by logical criteria. This is really helpful, particularly if you have a big data set and you have some specific inclusion criteria. Use a use a function like filter to um, to really narrow out your data set to just your inclusion criteria, and then mutate. Um, you can use to create new columns based off of a calculation. Just want to mention that there is many more dplyr functions. We didn't cover group by summarize. There's another powerful set of functions. Arrange helps you to order data. So this is very similar to like a sort you might do in Excel. Um, you can add rows. You can, uh, and then you, there are some operations that you can do to um, to actually join different data sets together, uh, put together different data sets, um, either by some um, key that between different data sets or kind of arbitrarily, if you have two um, data frames of the same size, you can, you can put them together uh, using some using function, the bind columns function to put data sets together, not based off of some key and join functions to, to put columns together or put data frames together based off of a key. So there are, you know, these and many other functions are on the dplyr cheat sheet. So I highly encourage you to take a look at that, particularly when you have these data transformation issues. Uh, and there's a variety of other functions uh, that help you tidy data, deal with dates and times, parse out strings, iterate, uh, and kind of do some actions repetitively, and then uh, actually uh, query and manipulate databases as well. So we are running low on time. I think um, we will jump right into the next lesson. We will uh, probably won't get through all of the next lesson, but I think uh, particularly for those who are interested in visualization and uh, and uh, looking at um, looking at uh, you know how you can pull together your data in in a way that is uh, easily digestible. Um, by others, uh, let's we'll cover a few concepts and dashboards. Maybe do one exercise before we uh, we break for the the workshop. So this last uh, dashboards lesson, we're going to talk a little bit about um, you know ways to communicate data using specifically a, a, a package that is really geared toward building dashboards and taking multiple plots or ways to visualize data and put, putting them into, into one format um, that, uh, that you can actually make interactive. So I'm sure at least some of the folks uh, in the workshop have, have at some point in their lives seen a dashboard or seen you know um, some representation of graphical data where multiple plots are put into one place for kind of the purpose of con consuming that data quickly um, and you know potentially a large amount of data uh, very quickly and, and deriving some understanding um, from that. Uh, and this is just an example. There are multiple nice examples of um, dashboards uh, using the package that we, we are going to cover here. So the, the package that we have found um, very useful and this is something that you know in, in my daily work actually we use very frequently uh, is called Flex Dashboard. And so this takes an R Markdown document and can turn it into an interactive dashboard. Uh, and so notice that this is, you know, this for the time being, this is really focused on R Markdown documents. Uh, R Markdown documents, you might recall, are uh, essentially similar to Quarto and, and how they function. There are just some differences in, in syntax here. And so um, this should be, um, you know, this this general framework of Flex Dashboard um, is, not, is should be pretty familiar in, in terms of just dealing with a uh, a document format that allows you to um, to include both text and graphics in, in one place. So this is an example here on the left hand side of a uh, flex dashboard uh, markdown document. 
So you can see there's a header, very similar to like our Quarto uh, document. Uh, in this case, we are specifying a flex dashboard output. Uh, and then there's a specific orientation that's called out uh, of columns. And so this, and then you can see on, uh, here in the, um, in the kind of text section of the document, there is a certain syntax to call out and carve out different columns. So you can call out, you know, the first column here, include some chart with a heading, um, you know, place some code, and that will physically put the, the contents or the output from this code chunk into this section of the, of the dashboard here. Then, you know, we call a, a second column here, and then here we've actually included multiple charts, which will be laid out uh, on in that second column. You can, this is an example of the column orientation. You can also orient this as rows just by changing the, the header and the, the syntax here. And so as opposed to calling out these columns with this, uh, with these underscores, we are calling out rows. Uh, and you don't, you know, there's no specific number of underscores you need to, to memorize. The nice thing is when you start one of these documents, uh, it actually, the markdown that you work with will will kind of pre-supply you or will give you will um, kind of give you a template uh, to work with uh, here. All right. So for this exercise, we're going to jump to O4 dashboards at RMD. This is going to look a little bit different than your Quarto document. Um, our studio is going to open this in this file in source mode. So this is uh, it, it looks more like the the raw text of the of the file, which actually the Quarto document would look like, you know, would look very similar to this in source mode. Um, but when we but by default, our studio will open it as visual. So don't don't be too concerned with that. Just um, open up this file uh, and it, this is going to work the same way as you would work with Quarto and that you can render or, or, or knit this. And so what we're going to do when we open this is um, go ahead and jump straight to knitting the document. Um, there might be, uh, depending on the version of RStudio, you might see a preview button instead of knit. Whether it's preview or knit, you'll, you should see a button uh, there in the same place that you saw render for Quarto. So hit that button. You may need to hit try again if you see a pop-up window, um, but just go ahead and knit that. That will, that will uh, show you what the dashboard looks like. And then we're going to go into the test volumes over time plot. And we are going to um, just tweak that plot to visualize the fraction of positive tests on a given day. And so this is just jumping back to your GG, GG plot lesson uh, using the fill aesthetic to and mapping that to, to result. Uh, and then knit the document again, note that change. And then finally change this layout from a column layout to a row orientation. So I'll give you five minutes uh, and then we'll come back together and walk through the exercise. All right, everyone, let's regroup. Um, we'll go through this relatively quickly. I've opened up the dashboards markdown document here. You'll see this is in source mode. You can kind of see our flex dashboard information up here. We are reading in that COVID testing data set. Uh, and, you know, if I hit knit here, I'll see a kind of quick, simple dashboard that pops up that shows a plot and, uh, a, you know, some, a table with some positive test results here. And so I'm going to go in and I want to make this modification to my plot. So I want to map the fill aesthetic to result. And so I'm going to just jump in here and map fill to results. Before knitting, I'm gonna also update the orientation here. So this will help put in the results into my ggplot and you know the fill of the, the bar plot will now um, map to the, the different results here. And then I'm gonna also change the layout here from columns to rows. So I can do that here. I see these are different columns that are, um, call that here, I'm just going to update this so that, you know, clearly label them as rows. If I knit this, I then see I now have rows splitting the, the two sections of the, of the dashboard. 
and I've mapped my results to to the fill here. So this is you know this is a pretty handy um, toolkit to very quickly create dashboards and you know really with a pretty simple syntax um, put in a series of plots or tables. Now we're not gonna we don't have time to to cover it here. Um, but again, the, you, you have access to the slides, you can review this uh, and see some of the other your turns. Um, you can very easily make plots interactive with the Plotly function just by taking your ggplot, storing that as an object, and then calling this function ggplotly your, uh, with your plot. You can use that to, to make any ggplot an interactive plot. Um, and then you can likewise for tables, you can use the data table function uh, with this from this DT package uh, to make interactive tables as well. And so there are exercises around this if you want to play around with this and uh, learn how to do this. Um, but these are very kind of quick ways to make your uh, dashboard interactive. And so someone mentioned, you know, this looks like a simpler simpler version of, of Shiny. And yeah, I mean, I think one of the the benefit of this format is that you have less complexity than setting up a, a Shiny app, um, but you can knit it into an HTML. The data is actually held kind of within an HTML, um, and you can share that with others um, so that you can that you can really open up on any modern web browser. So there's a variety of other ways you can style these um, dashboards. There are different themes that, um, that kind of have a uh, different look and feel to the dashboards. Um, and, uh, you know, these are kind of simple ways to take some of those skills that you've learned in manipulating data and using ggplot to turn it into a nice work product that you can use to, to communicate with others. So I, um, there's a variety of other uh, packages that are really focused on interactivity. Um, and you can just see some, some examples here. Um, and then Shiny is really that ultimate level of uh, interactivity in developing a web application, which has a higher level of complexity, but is ultimately a very versatile tool for, for making these web apps. And, there, and, you know, there are different ways that you can deploy, whether these are static HTML dashboards or web apps uh, as well. So with the, you know, we're at the end of time. I just want to uh, cover a few things or point out a few things that uh, that might be of value to you um, as you go on and you kind of develop uh, with these R skills. And so, um, you know, if you don't already have R and R Studio installed on your computer, um, there are instructions on the site, on the website to do that. You should already have that website on your email. And there's some guidance as to um, how to install the right packages and then take the code from, from this, um, from this course and use that uh, on uh, on your time there you know multiple exercises we didn't cover that you can cover on your on your time if you want to um, continue to develop these skills and we have those solutions as well uh, highly recommend when you have uh, straightforward questions about kind of these bread and butter tidyverse functions in particular the r for data science book it's freely available online uh, very nice resource uh, and there's also some solutions to the exercise as well. You, you know, that part of the value of going through R for data science is, is really learning by doing and doing some of those exercises. And you can find the solutions uh, to those as well. Um, we focused on Quarto because that's the kind of the newest uh, version or the, the next generation of R Markdown. Um, but there's a great resource uh, on R Markdown uh, that's publicly available uh, as well, freely available. Um, and there are multiple other kind of quarto highlights, both of our both of the keynotes for the R Medicine Conference uh, as well. Uh, and there's another workshop tomorrow focused on uh, on quarto. Um, so I just want to thank our TAs, uh, Rich, and, Rich and Sarah, for um, for helping out and uh, keeping us on track and answering questions. Want to thank all of you for your participation, uh, and please complete the post course survey we, we'd really appreciate it um, if you if you can complete this it looks like um, it's working now so um, please do fill that out and uh, we'll uh, we'll stick around some of us will be able to stick around the instructors and maybe the TAs might be able to stick around for a little bit um, afterwards to answer additional questions thank you all